Hi, Shalom from Tzor my home just outside Jerusalem. I'm so happy that you tuned in to my first video, first of hopefully several. Uh, what I wanted to do in terms of an introduction is just to give you a little bit of information, especially for people outside of Israel, about what's been going on here over the last couple of weeks and, and also, I suppose, what's been going on uh, in my life in the last couple of weeks. And I, I really look back two weeks ago and, and think how much the world has changed in, in such a short time. A couple of weeks ago, I, I recall that we had a, a wonderful family barbecue here in Israel. Um, family of my wife traveled from around the country to be there. We had a really amazing time. The coronavirus was, was one topic of conversation, but was certainly not the sole topic of, of conversation. Um, times were very innocent and, and, and we had a really uh, amazing time. Since then, things have changed quite dramatically. Uh, of course, two weeks ago, the coronavirus was here, but it was still very much seemed to be that thing going on in, in China um, and that thing going on in, in the Far East. Israel had imposed restrictions of travel from China, of course, and, and from other countries, but none of my business really comes comes from that part of the world. So, so nothing really um, had changed. I was looking forward to a bumper um, busy season, March, April, uh, and May. Uh, things changed very quickly. As the virus sort of spread to Europe, Israel started to impose flight and travel restrictions coming from Europe. Um, for me personally, many of my clients were getting very, very nervous. A few of them started to, to cancel. Only five or six days ago, really such a short time, did we, did we get the news that Israel was, repro uh, was um, adding restrictions to flights coming from the United States. Anyone coming from the United States, whether a tourist or, or an Israeli returning from the States, would have to self-quarantine for 14 days. And this, of course, was a, was a death blow for tourism. Um, every single one of my tours for the next month cancelled. I was meant to be um, guiding a 41-person student group from North Carolina. They cancelled about 48 hours before they were due to land in, in Israel. Um, and it was pretty crazy. I think that we were still in a time when obviously tourism was going to be affected um, terribly, certain other niche industries. But what I was thinking in my head was that I would be sitting at home maybe for, for a couple of months, but life outside of my little bubble was going to carry on pretty much as normal. Uh, my wife would be going to work. My kids would be going to school. Um, and things have really changed. So it seems like every day now there's a new directive from the government, a new speech on the television from um, our prime minister. Where we are up to now is that as of yesterday, we are on what one commentator I saw on the news called voluntary lockdown. Okay, we are not really going out of the house we're not really mixing with anybody else. Some people are still going to work, but most people are either not working at all or working from home. Supermarkets and, and pharmacies are still open, um, but everything else is shut down. So I am now at home with my wife. She, she's a therapist in a school. Her school has been closed. Uh, I'm home with my kids. Uh, my daughter is eight and my son is six. They are in the other room now starting their school day. The uh, amazing teachers have been giving them content that they can work on online. And for the foreseeable future, uh, we are home. We're, we're going out walking the dog. Um, if we need to, we'll go to the supermarket to stock up on supplies, although we're, we're pretty well stocked up. And apart from that, we're, we're going to be at home um, in the last four or five days when we were still out, um, I rushed into the old city. Things were every day shutting down and shutting down and shutting down. Um, and I filmed a fair bit of content, which I'll hopefully collate into three or four videos for you. I had hoped 
that over this whole two month or three month period, however long it would be, I would be free to travel around the country, um, and travel to and from Jerusalem and take some amazing videos for you. Hopefully the restrictions will be lifted soon and I will able to be um, doing that. If not, then hopefully the three or four videos that I'm going to post in the coming days will at least give you a, a certain taste of what's going on here. I think for me, the idea behind posting these videos is, is threefold. Um, and thank you so much to the couple of people who reached out to me and, and suggested that I, that I did this and planted the, the seed uh, in my head. The first reason why I'm doing it is for the people who had planned to come to Israel, for the people who had booked tours with me and had to cancel them. This is obviously not the um, same as being here, but hopefully it will be a little taster of what Jerusalem is all about. Hopefully it will whet your appetite for when, um, hopefully in a, in a very short time, you'll be able to rebook and, and you'll be able to, to come here. The second reason, um, which now seems a little bit crazy, is that the idea behind it was to help get me out the house. Um, I was really worried about being stuck at home. Um, I get a bit of cabin fever. I'm a workaholic. I like to be out and about. And if a, one or two days go by where I didn't go to the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem from my sleepy little town, then I start to pull my hair out. Of course, now we're on uh, essentially home lockdown. So we'll see how we go with the cabin fever. I, uh, I apologize to my wife in advance for having to suffer through this with me. The third reason, which is a little bit awkward for me to talk about, but it's financial. Uh, when people reached out to me, the suggestion that they gave me was that I film this content and I add a link to uh, PayPal for people who want to donate, um, or for people who enjoyed the content and want to give some money um, for the content. The reality is, is that with everything that's going on here, my business has been totally decimated. I have had cancellations uh, across the board for the next 10 weeks. Um, I haven't got any work for, for 10 weeks. And beyond that, who knows? Um, nobody knows how long this is going to go on for. Thank God we still have some money in the bank. Um, we are not going to starve to death, but eventually the money's gonna gonna run out. And um, I'm, I'm not uh, um, shy to admit it, it's a, it's a pretty scary thing. So if anyone does feel inclined to make a donation, the, the details are at the end of the video. Uh, I've come into the old city and I'm walking down this beautiful residential alleyway here that you can see friend of mine there in the background and i really love um, coming down these streets on my tours when the city is packed with tourists you turn a corner and you come down these beautiful residential alleyways that no tourists um, ever walk down I'm, I'm really inspired by a poem from israel's kind of national poet his name is yehud amachai He's passed away now, and he wrote this poem. He says, uh, once I was on my way home from the, from the market and I decided to take a rest with all of my bags by the Tower of David, an important site in the old city, where all of a sudden a tour guide and his group came past me and the tour guide used me as his reference point. And the guide says, you see that man over there? Well, he's not important, but above him and to the right, there's an arch from the Roman period. And he writes, In, inside I'm screaming, but I'm here, I'm, I'm real, I'm alive. And at the end of the poem he says, redemption will come when the tour guide says, you see that arch from the Roman period? It's nice, but down a bit and to the left, there's a man carrying food home to his family. And that, that um, poem really inspires me. And on my tours, I really like to show people just where people live like to show people the, the residential neighborhoods of the old city. So I'm walking around now and I'm about to arrive to a really beautiful site that I wanted to show you. 
The man you can see in the mosaic above you, his name is Mark, uh, Saint Mark, i.e. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And the Syrian Orthodox tradition holds that the house that was beyond this gate 2,000 years ago was the house of Saint Mark. And the tradition holds that Mark's mother um, invited Jesus and the disciples to celebrate the Passover feast uh, in this house. Um, this is what we would call the Room of the Last Supper. Many of you have been to Jerusalem and you visited the Room of the Last Supper. There is actually more than one Room of the Last Supper in Jerusalem. The far more famous one, the far more popular one, is from the Roman Catholic tradition. But the Syrian Orthodox tradition holds that the Room of the Last Supper took place just beyond the door over here. So I'm now inside the courtyard of the Syrian Orthodox quarter and you can see it's very much a self-contained quarter, a city within a city. There's the gate which uh, nowadays is completely closed. They, they kindly opened it for us. And over here you can see the church and around us there, there is residences, very small uh, Syrian Orthodox population in the world, about two, two and a half million, uh, and a small population here in Jerusalem as well. The church that unfortunately we can't go into um, has some really amazing stories attached to it. So let me tell you two of them. The first thing is that the language, the language that we saw above us on the mosaic, the language that you can see written over here as well, this is a very special language and the language is called Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic is an ancient language it's a Semitic language related to Hebrew uh, and Arabic. And if any of you know anything about Aramaic, probably the most common thing that people know about Aramaic is that it is the language of Jesus, the language of Christ. And we'll say a few more things uh, about that. If you were here visiting Jerusalem 2,500 years ago, the people walking around would largely be speaking Hebrew, ancient biblical Hebrew. There's a certain point in time in history when the Jews stop speaking Hebrew. Hebrew becomes a liturgical language, kind of like Latin would be for the Catholic Church today. And when the Jews stopped speaking Hebrew, they started to speak Aramaic. Um, now what I'm going to say now has got nothing to do with this church, but I think it's an amazing story nonetheless. Um, because 120 years ago, 130 years ago, there was not a single Jewish person in the world who spoke Hebrew. No one in the world spoke Hebrew. You've probably heard of a language called Yiddish, which was commonly spoken uh, across Central and, and Eastern Europe. 120 years ago, 130 years ago, with the advent of modern political Zionism, the leaders of Zionism, the, the thinkers of Zionism understood that if Zionism was going to be a successful national movement, it needed a shared common language and it didn't have one. So 130 years ago, the leaders of Zionism, and the most famous name is Eliezer ben Yehuda, um, revived and reinvented Hebrew. And Hebrew is, as far as I know, Hebrew is the only language in the history of the world which died out and has come back again. And not just come back, but it's the national language today. And that's an amazing story, absolutely nothing to do with this church, but an amazing story nonetheless. Now, most people would tell you that 2,000 years ago, the Jews were already speaking Aramaic. There's a debate. It wasn't like someone came along and clicked their fingers and mid-sentence, everyone switched language. But most people will tell you that 2,000 years ago, the Jews were speaking Aramaic. If the Jews were speaking Aramaic, then a very famous Jew, who was here 2,000 years ago, Jesus, he would have spoken Aramaic as his mother tongue. People think today that Aramaic is a dead language, but don't tell that to the Syrian Orthodox community of Jerusalem, because they still worship in Aramaic, they still, um, certainly the older generation still speak Aramaic, and there are communities of Syrian Orthodox Christians in Syria today, in Iraq, terribly persecuted of course, but whole communities who still speak Aramaic. And if you wandered into this church 
when they were praying, you would hear them praying in Aramaic, you would hear them praying in the language of Christ. And that's an amazing thing. So if we were able to go into the church, I would have wanted to show you this amazing icon. Um, this icon is the reason why up until a few months ago, this church was totally closed to the public. Um, it since was open to the public and now closed again because of the corona pandemic. But this icon, which is called the Icon of Miracles, the tradition holds that this icon was hand-painted 2,000 years ago by St. Luke. Luke was a, an artist and a doctor, and the tradition holds that Luke painted this icon. And as you can see, it's showing you Mother Mary and baby Jesus. But when you look a little bit closer, there's something unusual about baby Jesus. Because when Luke painted the body of Jesus, he painted the body of a baby. But when he came to paint the face of Jesus, he didn't paint the face of a baby. Because Luke never knew Jesus when he was a baby. He painted the face of Jesus that he knew. The face that was in front of him. Um, and with, that was the face of the adult Jesus. So the, for me, one of the really amazing things about this church is if you believe the tradition, if you follow the tradition, when you look at this icon, when you look at the face of Jesus, that's actually what Jesus looked like. And that's a really amazing thing. Um, it's called the Icon of Miracles because eight documented miracles have happened in front of this icon in this church. And several other miracles, uh, many other miracles, have happened with copies of, of the icon. So um, people come here and you can buy a copy like I'm holding up and, and people come and pray for, for miracles. So this is a, a real gem in the old city that very few people even know about. It's a, a real hidden gem of the old city. Hopefully when the church opens up uh, and things get better, I'll be able to go in and, and film the actual icon um, itself for you. So we can't go into the church. The church has been locked because of the coronavirus. But George, my, my friend here, wonderful guy, um, who's the caretaker of the church, uh, he normally has the key and lets people in. But I've asked him if he could really, for a treat for us, to sing us the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. So take it away, George. Thank you. Amen.